my name is Matthias. I'm filling in for my coworker Carissa because she's feeling sick today. Um, so you, unfortunately, you're gonna have to do, uh, do with me. Uh, oh, yeah, I think it's turned on now. I'm saying I'm filling in for my friend Carissa, uh, who is also my coworker. We both work on the that project, and she's feeling uh, ill today. So yeah. So this is gonna be a little bit improvised, which is probably gonna make it even better. Yeah. My name is Matthias. Uh, I go by Muffintosh online. If you're on IRC or any of those things, that's how you get in touch with me. Anyways, I'm going to talk about the, that project, and um, I'm going to try to do some demos also. And my computer didn't work on this uh, using this adapter because I have one of those new fancy computers that doesn't work with anything anymore. Uh, so Jeremy was kind enough to lend me his computer, so th that way you also know that this is actually going to be live demos and not just cheating, which is great. Um, yeah. So, how many in here have heard about that before? Okay, that's pretty good. We've done a good job doing that. So, I work mostly on the technical stuff, uh, but we, we're only three people, so we all tend to work on everything. Basically, that is an uh, open source tool for sharing uh, data and versioning data. And uh, what that means, hopefully, you'll get a little bit better understanding of after this talk. Um, we're a nonprofit project, primarily funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Uh, which is great uh, because they pay me. I like that. I like getting paid. Um, which also means that we are like completely non-profit. Uh, everything is completely open source. We try to do as much things as many things as possible in the open. Uh, we tend to do all our meetings on uh, live YouTube hangouts and stuff like that. So if you ever want to get involved, just you know go on Getter IRC. Uh, it's very easy to get involved. Um, that is a three-person team. Um, currently, and we currently maintain more than 800 modules on NPM. I usually put this stat up here because I maintain 400 of them, which is like the most, so that's important to note. Uh, fun fact about NPM is that NPM has around, I think it's 200,000 modules, so this is a percent, and since you're all data scientists, you'll realize that it's around half a percent of 200,000, so if you ever install 200 modules, there's probably a good chance you installed one of ours, so you're welcome. Um, yeah, so, <clears throat> like I said, that is a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing network. Uh, it's all written in JavaScript, because JavaScript is awesome. Um, and it mostly works in the browser also, because it's written in JavaScript. And it's primarily built for sharing data set and data sets and versioning data sets. Um, <clears throat> we kind of talk about this a lot, about, you know, making tools that allow you to move uh, your data to the code, instead of moving your code to the data. Um, and we actually, change that bit to just mean uh, data is just files, so it's all about just moving, you know, files to the code. Uh, and actually it's a little bit better than that because it's mostly just about only moving the files you need. Uh, so in, in data science we tend to have these huge data sets, you know, millions of files, they're all really big, but you might run an analysis pipeline that only uses like a couple of them or like only parts of them. Uh, so we try to make tools that allow you to do that, basically. Oh, and all in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, so you don't need to host anything anywhere. Basically, you can have a whole, a huge network of people uh, helping each other out and uh, sharing the data. Um, similar to BitTorrent, if you're familiar with that. Um, so we share a lot of the same ideas behind BitTorrent. We just try to apply them to science instead of uh, movie sharing, uh, which is awesome. So how does that look like? Well, it's, right now it's a command line tool. It's really simple because it only has two commands. So you can install that from NPM. Uh, I should have put a slide in there that told you how to do that, but I just did these slides 10 minutes ago. So I'm gonna tell you now, you can do NPM install that. That's how you do it. Once you get the tool, you just need to run that link and then you need to give it a file. And I can try doing that real quick just to see, show you that it works. So hopefully it's done installing. Yo. What's up? Oh, it doesn't show over there. I didn't realize that. Sorry about that. We're on it. It's not my computer. Um, yeah, so you can get it from NPM. You just do NPM install uh, that, and that's also how you get updates. Well, when you want to get updates, you just run NPM install that again, uh, which takes like a couple of minutes, and then you have it on your computer. We're also working on a desktop app. If you're not a big fan of command line tools, um, that will allow you to just click a button instead of running a command. Uh, that's okay. fine. Awesome, thank you, Jeremy. So, is this big enough? Can people kind of see what's happening here? 
Cool. So you will run npm install dash gg and that, and you'll get the tool. Uh, I'm not going to do that because this takes a, takes a couple of minutes. I'm not going to waste time on it. So I did it before, cheated a little bit. It's fine. Can, allowed to do that once in a while. See if I can find my demo. Oh, it's here. Cool. And then if you wanted to share a file, and I have some cool files in here, I have one that's a C3 file, you just do that link, and you just put in the, uh, the file, and that will traverse the file and give you this that link that you can just copy. See if I can figure out how to copy on Jeremy's computer. Just do like that. And then uh, you can just give this to a friend and run it with that command and it will automatically find the other person and start downloading the data and there's also APIs for only getting a partial data. So it's a, it's really, really simple tool actually. And this, uh, this link has enough information to kind of verify the content to make sure that you're actually getting the right content. It's like a cryptographic uh, proof of the content and stuff like that. So that's like the primary use case. Um, see if I can figure out how to get back to this. Cool. Yeah, so you know, you link and you get data. That's basically it. Uh, so the cool thing about this, at least I think, is that, you know, it's actually really, really simple to use. Uh, it's very, um, because there's only two commands, so once you get the command wrong, it's probably the other one. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, there are more things we want out of a tool like this. For example, if I share a data set, right, and um, I update that data set, I don't want to download the entire thing again. Um, something, if you're familiar with source code, we, you know, we take for granted when using a tool like Git. Um, so we spend a lot of work trying to make uh, diffing better. Uh, so if you download two similar data sets, they, um, you only download like the diff between these two data sets, right? And that's a little bit tricky because data sets are just files, so files can be anything, right? So I'm gonna get a little bit, get a little bit technical because that's what I like to do. Um, so how do you do it? Well, basically, if you have a file, the way you normally do it is, if you have some way of div uh, dividing a file into chunks, it's a lot easier to reason about. And a chunk is just like a partial file, right? So if you're familiar with uh, how Git works, uh, Git cheats, because it's all about picking a good chunk. And in Git, if you have some source code, a really good chunk in source code is a line, right? Because that's kind of like the natural delimiter when we write source code. You'll write something, you put a line in there, you put a bunch of new lines. So Git just, you know, uh, acknowledges this and divides everything into a line and says this is, every line is a chunk and that's kind of like everything I'll deal with independently. So if I change a line, in this example I changed like the second line, um, if I then look at uh, all of the chunks compared to two, two versions of this file, you know, three out of four lines are the same, right? So that's pretty good for a diff because that means that if we have a system that's a little bit smart, you can figure out that it only needs to uh, sync that one line, right? So this is a really good model, it's really simple, it works really well, if you ever use Git, you'll probably try it out and it works super awesome. Uh, there's only one problem, it only works for text files and not everything is a text file. Um, if you ever tried to put a binary file into Git, you'll probably realize that this doesn't work that well. Um, so we'd use this technique called Rabin fingerprinting, which is almost the same idea, except that instead of just using new lines, you use some cryptographic magic to find something better than a new line, but it's kind of like the same idea. You find some sort of natural delimiter in a file. So it kind of works like this, where it's, it's an algorithm, and we didn't even invent it. It's something like from the 70s, I think. There's some cool papers out there for it, where um, you have an algorithm that kind of scans for a file, and it will give you chunks based on the actual content. So it will look at the content, do like a sliding window kind of thing, and once in a while, it will find the delimiter it likes based on some parameters that are not, uh, you know, coupled to the actual file, uh, file content, and say, oh, this is a good chunk, this is a good chunk. And not all the chunks are the same, they're like, you know, some are big, some are small, but you can kind of tweak it to be around, a, you know, some uh, size that you like. So the really, really cool thing about this is that if you were to insert something in the middle of the file, um, a Rabin chunk, or when it scans through it again, will produce the same chunks on both sides of the file, which is actually really cool. Uh, the only thing that might change are like the neighboring chunks. So in this example, that's the, I guess that's kind of orange colored. I'm not sure how to call that color. Beige. Beige, yeah, yeah, beige, it's pretty good. Uh, so 
then uh, if you use a Rabin trunk, only the base things would, would, would change, and that's the only thing you would then need to diff. Uh, it's on NPM, if you're interested in that. There's a Rabin chunker. We, me and Max wrote called uh, Rabin. You can try it out. Um, so the really cool thing about this technique is that it allows you to, if you have two independent files that are similar, it allows you to, uh, without uh, declaring that they're similar, just figure it out by running it through a Rabin chunker, and then you'll notice that like most of the chunks are the same. So it's, it's actually a really, really powerful technique that works really well for syncing files. Um, we also have this notion of, uh, if you ever download a file, you should only download it once. Uh, if somebody else shares the same file, you shouldn't have to download it again. Um, similar to that, using something like a repeat chunk, we also only want to download parts of a file once. So if, if a person is, is, is sharing uh, a file and, and uh, her friend is sharing a similar file, you don't want to download the similar parts uh, twice, right? And we, we use this cool technique for that called the uh, Merkle trees. <laughs> it's my favorite slide. Uh, and I'm not going to go into detail to that, but that's just a really, really cool technique where you like, you know, get all these things for free. Right, and that's also on NPM. Anyway, so that's like the core part of it. How much time do I have left? Okay, cool, that's a lot of time, that's awesome. Uh, so I can make a lot of figures now. So, I, you know, that's the, it, the theory, if you're interested in hearing more about how it actually works, like, you know, low level, come talk to me, I can, I'll, I won't stop talking about it, so you have to go away at some point, which is fine, I won't judge you. Um, but I thought, you know, it's, it's more fun to show some demos instead, because that's probably a better way to understand it. Um, so, let's see if I can, cool. Go to Jeremy's browser here, that's awesome. So, as you, um, as I said in the beginning, this is all written in JavaScript, and a lot of people are like, you know, why JavaScript compared to Python? Python is big in uh, like data science, and uh, Python is awesome. But a really, really cool thing about uh, JavaScript is that it runs in the browser, right? Uh, and by running something in the browser, you get a programming platform or like a runtime that's basically installed anywhere, and you can just tell anybody to click on a link. So I thought for some demos, I'm just going to make that run in the browser. So uh, I did that and uh, did a website. See if I can remember the URL. Uh, there we go. So don't judge me on the UI because it's pretty awesome. Uh, so I, it's like all about being minimalist and only you know communicating what you want to communicate. So that is built on this uh, low-level component we call Hyperdrive uh, because I thought it was kind of a cool name because I like to call things hyper because you know hyperlink stuff. And then somebody told me, I didn't even realize this, but you know, hyperdrive is the, that's the thing in Star Wars that's ne that never works. Uh, which I guess is, a, guess is a good analogy for my tool. Anyway, um, so this is just uh, that running in the browser and like I said, you know, that had those, has those two links, uh, two commands, one called link and one called, one called uh, fetch. And when you drag and drop files here, it'll basically just do a, a link in the browser. Uh, I'm just gonna open the console here so I can see what's going on. Cool. So, I put some files on uh, Jeremy's computer. They are here. So, what I can do is I can just like take a file, I'm gonna take a picture, and I can just uh, drag it here and it adds, the, it adds the file, and the version is it's using that, and my cool uh, demo here will uh, give me a link back, that's the dead link, but it's in the browser. And I can actually just send this link to a friend of mine. Um, hopefully the network gods will uh, allow me to show you this. Um, so, <coughs> So the two browsers will find each other using a um, discovery mechanism we have, and then they'll start sharing each other, but all the transfers are actually happening peer-to-peer. -peer. So it's all peer-to-peer -peer in the browser. We can also run this in Node, or like in a desktop app, or using write bindings for any language you want. The protocol is actually pretty uh, straightforward and simple if you've ever done anything with distributed systems. Um, <laughs> which I guess is like a cop-out answer. It's like, it's super easy if you understand it completely. <laughs> Uh, and in my demo, I can click the picture and I can kind of watch the picture in the browser, which is awesome. Um, and um, 
the cool thing is that I can also kind of showcase diffing, showcase diffing a little bit in a very primitive scenario. So if I reload this page, uh, I have this folder here where I have the same picture a bunch of times, which is like a really trivial uh, diff, you could argue, but anyways, it's still a diff. So what happens if I share like all these files, all these hundreds uh, of pictures that are the same? Like actually, it's kind of funny because the main bottleneck in this in the browser is actually just adding files because that's kind of slow in the browser because it has to do the hashing. Um, so if I add a bunch of files and I get this link, I paste it in here. Uh, reload. Come on, reload. There you go. It's all about understanding uh, Jeremy's keyboard shortcuts, I guess. Uh, so if I um, load this archive instead, see if it loads. Invalid hex string. They're like, oh, I put a thing at the end because I copied it wrong. I'm sorry about that. At least that's, that's what I think I did. Let's see. Um, this is why it's good to have 13 minutes to do your demos when <laughs> things don't work the way you hope they work. Anyways, there we go. So, see if I accidentally changed the link. I did not. So if it, like, it finds the peer again, and then hopefully it will start downloading that uh, list of data. May, even if it doesn't, it's probably okay. Just right, we're downloading this. I'm running this over my uh, mobile connection on my phone. That's tethered to Denmark. I'm from Denmark, I didn't say that. Uh, so, you know, network doesn't always work the way you want it to work. So I don't know if you can see it here, but it just li li uh, listed all the files, and it told me that I'm downloading with 20 megabytes per second, because the download speed here is actually telling me the data transfer, but not the network transfer. So because of that diffing technique, it figures out that all, almost all the files are the same, or they all the same, and it only transfers once, but the data transfer tells me that you actually got 20 megabytes of data uh, per second. Um, so, and you get the same technique, even if the files are not the same, but similar, right? So it's a really powerful technique, and the really cool thing I like about it is that it's actually really user-friendly, because uh, uh, users don't need to know the files are different, uh, similar. The system will kind of just figure it out. Uh, so you, from a user's point of view, you just uh, sync files, which is awesome, or data sets. So let's try to actually sync a data set, uh, because that's what we're all here for. So a CSV conf, so I need to sync a CSV data set, and I have one here. And I can't even remember what it is. I think it's like uh, earthquake data uh, for a month, and it's around 100 megabytes. So this is my progress UI, where it tells me how far it's written into the file. It could probably use a little bit of work. Uh, so, this is a CSV file I added. And if I sync this file, it's pretty cool, uh, because... <clears throat> I'm trying to show this. So this is a bigger file, right? This is 100 megabytes. It could be a gigabyte or even a terabyte. Uh, it will still work. I just don't want to add a terabyte in the browser, because then we'll stand here for like 10 minutes waiting for it to hash, which is... Uh, not so fun. <clears throat> but if we wait a couple of seconds for these uh, two peers to find each other, um, we'll try something different. Then we'll try uh, to only partially sync the files. Um, so the cool thing is that if I'm only interested in the first part of the CSV file, I can just click this now and actually only load the first parts of the CSV file while it's syncing the rest in the background. And I can keep doing that. And so this is a pretty trivial example where I'm just reading the first parts of the file, but you can imagine like more cool examples where you actually know which part of the CSV file you're interested in, or doing like a distributed search on it. Yeah, go ahead. Are these discrete chunks that you're looking at? Or, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I don't know what discrete means in this sense. I just mean, are they, does it set the file in individual chunks? Yeah, so it's all random access. So this is just because it's the easiest thing to show in a demo, it's like the first chunk, but you can get any chunk of data in the file. You can even get the last one or the first one. So to kind of showcase this, uh, just uh, I'll just quickly do this. Is you can actually you can do a cool thing where you actually um, add a movie instead, which is like not a data set, but you know. And um, if I add a movie, see if that works. 
at a, at a movie instead because movies are interesting because movies give us gives us a visual uh, thing that we can actually seek in, right? Um, oh, it's the wrong link. Sorry about that. It's my UX here is not so great because I don't update the link twice. Uh, I'll add it again. So <clears throat> this is a hundred something megabyte movie. It'll be done in a couple of seconds. So the cool things about something like a movie or even a lot of other data sets is that you know it's it's inherently seekable, right? Uh, you can start watching a movie before it's done downloading, but you can even start watching like the last parts of a movie before it's done downloading. You can apply the same technique to data sets where, you know, assuming you have an index somewhere, you can, you know that you're only interested in the last parts of a data set, you can actually get that. It's all about just finding a way of re representing that choice to your uh, users, in my opinion, which is also non-trivial. Um, so let's try this one more time. So, <coughs> let's see if this works. It's my final demo, in case somebody is watching the time. You have, uh, negative two minutes. Okay, that's pretty good. So I can just go keep on forever. So if I click this movie, uh, hopefully it will start playing. Um, so I have a tendency of always picking a movie with like a lot of blackness in the beginning. So the movie is playing, and if I can scroll to the to the seeking bar here, I can seek into the middle of the movie. And the system, because it's just dealing with files, <laughs> I ran into a very dramatic part of the movie there. The system, uh, the video player tells the data synchronization to only sync, you know, that part of the movie. So, you know, if you think about this, not in terms of movie, but in terms of data sets, right, it becomes super interesting. So you can have a data pipeline. If your data pipeline high level wise does random access, our system will just sync out the data, just the data it needs. Uh, and, and, no, it doesn't matter if it's like a gigabyte of data or a terabyte of data or even a petabyte of data, like the technique still works. So yeah, um, that's uh, basically it, I think. Let me go back to the slides real quick. Yeah, so some links here. There's be some slides online. I'm gonna take one question before. No time? Okay. I'm gonna take questions at lunch if anybody is interested in hearing more. Thank you.